the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. everybody and it's so nice to see all of you we're pretty laid back and we only have a few rules uh, number one when uh, you want to speak please raise your hand so Jerry can get to you and always use your full name um, refrain from using nicknames when you talk about people and also don't visit while uh, Jerry is videoing it because it picks up in the video the poster I had restored and uh, it is from tourist Inn. I got it from Jeannie Shady the night she did her presentation and it was all in pieces and it was real brittle and it was just falling apart. So I took it to a Great Lakes company but they couldn't pull it through the roller for me to get a copy. So then I took it to the framing shop, they suggested that and they did a method called dry gluing. And they put the pieces and everything together and it really turned out nice and we're going to let it here and we hope LTC will accept it as part of the Cleveland rule. And the year is the non there, and the year is 1917 when this poster was used. So, okay, should we start introductions? And again, uh, thank you for uh, Soaring Eagle family for coming and doing this presentation. And of course, we're the Greater Centerville Historians. And it's April 13th, 2009. Okay? okay. I'm Julie Maurer and I'm from Newton. Yes. I'm Kelsey Maurer and I'm from Newton. Okay, thank you. I'm Cheryl Bauer and I'm from Newton. Audrey Ertle from St. Nazian's. Thank you, Audrey. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Irene Dyne, Cleveland. Thank you. Maureen Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Marie Rowe. Marie Rosenbauer from Newton. Thank you. Jeff Elson from Newton. Lisa Elson from Newton. Thank you. Frederick Jacoby from Manitowoc. Paul Jacoby from Cleveland. Thank you. Kathy Wagner from Cleveland. Dolores Crest from Cleveland. Walter Crest from Cleveland. Thank you, Walter. John Wiegan, town of Centerville. Thank you. Eldred Eager, Sheboygan. Thank you. Julie Maurer from Newton. Thank you. Jim Fitzgerald from Osmond. Okay, thank you. Sandy Fitzgerald from Osmond. Thank you. 
Kés jókondjóga. Vekkös jókondjóga. Rosigler, Contract XX Newton. Red Fire Store, Tommy. Now we need Cleveland. Kathy, you need Cleveland. Edith Lindsay, Cleveland. Marie Pepper, Cleveland. Salma Volgo, Cleveland. Charlie Bauer from Newton. Okay, and Jerry O'Neill from the town of Newton also. And I am your videographer for the evening, and uh, I guess at this point we can perhaps start with the presentation. And thank you to the Greater Center Centerville Historians for asking us to come and share our story. Um, I'm sure a lot of the audience still has ties to dairy and to farming, but we find that a lot a lot fewer people can say that today, and so we try to get out and, and share our story as, as much as we can. Um, I do welcome anyone who has questions as we go along, so please ask them. I think it makes more sense, and when a question comes up, if you just raise your hand, we'll get Jerry to catch you on the camera, and um, any, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. So this is Soaring Eagle Dairy today. Um, my parents, Jim and Sandy, are on the left. Um, the, the young girls here in the front. Look at that. <laughs> this is my family, my husband and our two girls. My sister Kelly, her husband, and their three children, and then my sister Stacy and, and her husband, Jeremy. The three girls. Uh, our partners with my mom and dad in the operation. Um, we all kind of took different routes, I would say. Kelly, uh, after high school, she went to short course at Madison um, and started on the dairy. Actually, when it that's all she's ever done, as has Stacy. Um, I did have uh, about 11 years at Kohler Company before coming back to the dairy, but um, that's our our motley crew today. So if we go back to um, his, in history a little bit, um, Jerry, or uh, Charlie, your battery, I think. <laughs> but that's okay, I think I'll be all right. It's all right. So us three girls, um, Again, it's Jim is our father and, and Sandy our mom. Sandy Stahl was her maiden name. Um, her parents were Herb and Veronica Stahl, and they farmed, um, I guess what would be in the town of Newton. They were up on um, South Union Road, just a little bit south, north of Newton Road. So uh, she was a grew up on a farm as well. But then dad and my grandpa was John Fitzgerald, and my grandma was Genevieve, Jenny Crawl. Um, I've got a little bit of, oh, look at that, a spelling error. Um, a little bit of uh, history on grandma and grandpa Crawl, and, and we'll get into that, but they have some um, history in dairy as well. Grandpa uh, had a career in um, milk production, or uh, milk processing. And then Grandpa Fitzgerald's parents were Simon and Nellie. Um, they were both locally born, town of Mimi, and um, in Liberty, Gram Great Grandma Barnes was, was born. Um, and then, actually, I, from Grandpa Fitzgerald, Great Grandpa Fitzgerald, I was able to trace it back to um, Ireland on my great great grandmother's side. Um, and the first of the Fitzgeralds um, came, came to the U.S. in 1948 due to the potato famine. Um, they spent some time in Ithaca, New York, before, um, before moving to this area. Um, few blanks and things where we didn't have all of the information, but this is, this is the 
the, uh, the things we did have. So my great-grandparents, Simon and Nellie, that's a, a picture of them. Um, Simon was born on the homestead, and the homestead is where my uncles currently farm, uh, and that is a mile west of Highway 42 on F, and their dairy is Fitz Pine Dairy, um, still in operation today by my uncles uh, Bob and Jay Fitzgerald and their families. Um, they also, uh, Simon had a, a brother named Joe who was married to Mary All, and they had, their farmstead was across the road, actually in the home, today uh, uh, occupied by the Elsons um, that are, are here visiting with us tonight. Um, and after the Alls, it was purchased by the Hibberts, and Harry Hibbert operated that, that farm later on. Um, I, this was a great exercise for me in that I have a, a whole new appreciation for life for my great-grandparents and my grandparents, but especially my grandfather. Um, my great-grandfather, Simon, died when he was 39 years old. He uh, had taken a trip, I think it was to Spring Valley, um, to, to I, I believe he took some, some wheat or something, and it was a, a couple day trip or a day long trip, and he came back, and as my grandfather's writings say, he was chilled to the bone. And it was the onset or the development of pneumonia, which uh, eventually took his life. He, he died, I think, within the week. But he left my great-grandmother, Nellie, to raise six children. Um, the oldest was nine, and that was my grandfather, John. And then the youngest was my great-aunt, uh, Rosie. <coughs> she was Rosie Herzog, um, and she was six months of age when her father passed. This is another picture of Simon. And then this is the, a picture of the homestead. So. Um, this was Grandma and Grandpa Fitzgerald's home. Um, the picture was taken in 1942, and I remember them living there until, I would say it was the mid-80s when they built a house off the farm. Um, if I may interrupt, what road was that on, please? That's on Highway F, okay. and it's just a quarter of a mile west of Highway 42. Thank you. And then, um, these are some of the, the outbuildings, and Dad and I went through these just today. So this was the, the barn that housed the livestock, uh, and we'll get into the animals that they had. There's a chicken coop over here, and then a machine shed here. Um, these buildings, well, the chicken coop is gone. Part of this building is, is still standing today, but it's been um, modified quite a bit, and actually this this shed is still there as well. I mentioned um, my great-grandfather on my grandmother's side, Ed, Ed and Rose Kroll. And, uh, Grandpa Kroll, he served in World War I. Um, that is a picture on their wedding day. I learned that if you were married in the winter, you didn't wear a, a gown back in the day, so that's why she's wearing the suit. Um, he graduated from what my grandfather in his writings referred to as dairy school. We're not sure if that was sort of like the short course that's offered today at University of Madison, or if it was something more geared toward cheese making, since there were so many cheese factories and things back in those days. But after dairy school, he was a, a cheese maker uh, in Grimm's and in Clark's Mills, and then he served as a field man for the Nestle Bottling or Milk Company in Valders for 38 years. He retired at the age of 65 from the White House Milk Company in Manitowoc. And uh, Grandpa Kroll was 97 um, when he passed. He was uh, always, I, I remember him doing little cartwheels and uh, kids jumping all, all over him and well into his 60s and probably pushing 70. Um, has anybody here seen this book? I think this is the group that probably would have. But um, Mom and Dad had this book, and it was in a pile of 
uh, a collection of uh, historical things and news clippings and things and thought, I wonder what this is, just some interesting reading or I, I didn't know. But then um, in the inside, there's a part where they did some research for the publishing of this book and my great grandfather contributed to it. So it, it reads, in 1916, the Wisconsin Condensed Milk Company built a milk processing plant in Valders. It was sold a few years later to Nestle. It ceased operation in 1954, and in 1959, the plant was purchased by the Allen B. Smith Milling Company. Um, it goes on, and then it, it says, the operations of the company are remembered by 94-year-old Ed Kral of Valders. Mr. Crawl was the owner of a cheese factory in Clark Mills, Clark's Mills across the street from the Morgan Grocery Store, which is now at the Pinecrest Historical Village. Um, and then it, it goes on to uh, talk about how Grandpa spent his entire life in the milk business and when witnessed many changes. Some were accepted willingly and others were not. So I thought that was interesting that Grandpa, great Grandpa Crawl, uh, helped with, with part of the writings of that book. Um, my great grandfather, or my grandfather John Fitzgerald, he, um, he died uh, as a result of a car accident in 1988. And about a year and a half before uh, he passed, he had started to do some writings, which I am so grateful for because we've learned so many things about his life, his growing up, our ancestry, uh, and so forth. But um, I, I pulled a few interesting things out and, and just noted them, but in it he, he says that life was very hard from 1928 to 1936. So not only had his father passed um, shortly before that, but it was the Depression. There were some hard cropping years. There were hard dairy years. and. And life was just hard without things like electricity and, and all the things that we take for granted. Um, after his father passed, uh, his mother hired someone to do what he referred to in his writing as the man's work. So I think the kids helped with a lot of the feeding the chickens, and I know Grandpa would take the milk to um, the milk plant before school and some of those things. but. The man's work or the, the real hard labor was done by somebody that had been hired. Um, the pay for him was 50 cents a day in the winter months and a dollar per day for the rest of the year. And they would milk by hand 14 to 15 animals in the spring and the, through the fall of the year. And then it would just be four or five in winter. And Grandpa in his writing commented that he didn't understand that because you always were paid more for your milk in winter than you were in summer, so why wouldn't you make more milk in, in the winter? I thought that was interesting. Uh, in addition to the milking herd, they, they usually had four or five heifers, six calves, a couple of sows, some hogs, a thousand chickens, and, or a thousand. <laughs> that would be today's numbers. A hundred chickens, and um, of course the horses too operate the farm as well. Grandpa talked uh, in his writings about the Great Depression. And I, I love this quote. Anyone who had gone through the Depression had a built-in caution the rest of his life. And I think there are a lot of people today that could have used a little bit of that caution, considering the state of our financing industry and the economy and, and so forth. Grand, Grandpa talked about how during that time there was no unemployment, no social security, no welfare, no food stamps, and I added bailouts. <laughs> I'm thinking nobody bailed out back in that day. And then he talked of how during that really difficult time there, there came a drought in which they had three foot uh, high corn stalks that had no cobs, and so not only did they not have the money, but they didn't have the feed to feed their animals. So it was a very tough time. Howard's Grove, Grove Bank failed. Again, no bailout. Nobody came to Howard's Grove Bank's rescue. And um, my great-grandmother and others who were sending um, 
who did banking there, they, they lost a milk check. Um, the deposits weren't guaranteed. There was no FDIC. Um, Grandpa Fitzgerald graduated from high school in Howard's Grove. He started in Manitowoc. My uncle graduated in, uh, from Lincoln in Manitowoc, and oh, this would be my great uncle, I'm sorry. And some of my great aunts went to the, um, I believe it was a convent uh, in Green Bay. And it was interesting for me that whether you received an education or not depended on if somebody was driving past and was able to give you a ride to school. So his early years, somebody was headed to Manitowoc and he caught a ride and went to Lincoln for a year. But then later on, that transportation fell through or didn't exist anymore. So he caught a ride with somebody going the other way. And he actually got his high school diploma from Howard's Grove. Um, Grandpa talked about how he, uh, early in the morning, would haul the milk to the Rhodes Cheese Factory in Osmond. Charlie? Yeah, I got a question on that Rhodes now. The Rhodes Cheese Factory that I'm aware of was located in Nordheim. Yeah. Was there two Rhodes Cheese Factory? I don't know. Okay, we have a gentleman here with a question. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Frederick Jacoby. Well, cheesemakers uh, move from time to time from one factory to another. And so that's likely the answer here. Because okay. In, in when I was a, a kid, uh, then the roadies were operating in North Time, but it, uh, that's what happened. They, cheesemakers moved. Okay, okay. And um, I'm s I would think he had it hauled it to Northheim if there was a factory in Austin because that was just a, a mile down the road. He talked of how um, their horses were maybe older and, and slower and their wagon was a little on the rickety side so he was always a bit humbled when the faster horses and wagons would pass him by as he was going. But, he, he would haul the milk to the factory in Osmond um, before school, and then he'd bring home the way to feed the pigs. If you didn't get to the factory early in the day, then you didn't get the way for your pigs. Do you have a question, Jerry? Maybe we have a gentleman here who had a question. Well, I just heard, no, I don't have a question. <laughs> First, I need Can I name. add something? <laughs> I need your name, uh, Frederick Jacoby. Thank you. I, I just was reminded, the tavern that was on the north end of Osmond, which was Don Hillstrom for many years, I don't know what's in there now, for sure. How many know where Hillstrom's bar was? All right. That was a cheese factory. And, um, uh, and... No, it was the other one. It's uh, Osterlots was the cheese factory. Yeah. Which one? Osterlots. Out on the other end of town. I'd be Goldie's. Uh, Goldie's okay. All right, could be. I, I always thought it was the one that was Hillstrom's. Oh. Close enough. And my wife's grandfather, Ernst Sigelko, ran that before he moved to Edwards. He was there a number, any number of years. Okay. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Go right ahead, please. I'm Kathy Sixel. And where was the cheese factory uh, located? On the, on the corner now where that uh, plant is? That would be, when I, when I read about hauling milk by horse and buggy to the cheese factory in Osmond, I assumed it was the one down in the corner by Point Creek because in my memories that's the only place I ever remember there being a cheese factory. But if there was another factory in Osmond, it could have been, it could have been any, I don't know. Dad, do you know? Okay, pertaining to the factory. What? Pertaining to the factory. To the factory? Yes, the one on the corner. Kathy Sixel, and at one time the uh, cheese factory on the corner, would that would be not F, but Point, Point Creek. Point Creek Road was owned by Norbert and Millie Schmidt. And okay. today it's the Metco Company that has their offices in Cleveland and their plant out there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Ed, Ed, please. Okay, we'll move on. This is just a sample of um, Grandpa's writings and one of my favorite stories. And it reads, when I started, and the date cut off, but I believe it was written in November of 87 or 88. Um, and he, he titles it, I Remember. And it, it reads, when I started plowing with a walking plow and three horses in the late cold fall, 
I would start plowing as soon as chairs and breakfast were done. Nights were freezing, and it was a race to finish plowing before freeze-up. About 10 o'clock, Mother would walk out to the field with lunch. Two fried egg sandwiches, still hot, and a jar of coffee. This tasted as good as dinner served at the best restaurant. I suppose she was trying to encourage an 18-year-old. You know, and I, I think of my generation and how much, how much would anybody my age appreciate two fried egg sandwiches and a cup of coffee for lunch. And we certainly wouldn't compare it to the best restaurant. Um, so I find it interesting that at age, at this point, Grandpa would have been 70, you think? 70 or just 70, that he would have that recollection at 70 of that good egg sandwich and yeah, how, how much he appreciated that at 18. <clears throat> Grandpa talked about um, in 1938 they planted an extra 10 acres um, to pay for electricity. It was their intention. They were going to do a little cash cropping. So they had the money to have the electricity put in. They had a great crop, as he writes, and it was shucked in the field. The thrashing machine arrived on Saturday, but they decided to wait till Monday. The, the thrashing crew had been at it for several weeks, and they had, had needed a day off. So um, Monday came, and it, it rained, and it rained on and off for about a week, and the barley began to sprout. They didn't have the three-day or seven-day or month-long forecasting that we have today. And so as a result, it was three years until it was 1941 before they were able to get electricity. Whoa. Um, these are some of the stories that, that I got from Dad that he recalled Grandpa saying. Um, and, and Grandpa used to say that if you were going to try and start that 1930-something forts and tractor, it didn't pay to even start it unless you were going to use it all day because, you know, this would have been early in the day of, of gas motors, and uh, it must have been a bugger to get running. <laughs> um, in 1946, Grandpa from Thomas Brothers uh, Implement in Cleveland bought a tractor. And this was right after the war, and they were just starting to produce tractors again. And so he bought a 1946 new Farmall M tractor. The kicker was they had this quack digger that they'd been trying to get rid of for quite some time, and they'd only sell him the tractor if he took the quack digger too. So that's a, a picture of a similar piece of equipment. And... Um, the way Dad explains, you know, because I have never seen a quack digger work or even, you know, I can only guess what it's intended to do. Um, but in the fall, after the corn came off, they would go through and it would pull up any of the quack grass or quack from the, the field and it would sort of lay it on top so it hopefully would die off. And a few weeks later, it'd start to green up again, so you'd have to go out and run through with the quack digger again. And then, lo and behold, in spring, you planted your corn and the quack came up anyway, so you had to cultivate. So, um, yeah, a lot different than, than the way we do things today. Question. Charlie has a question. Yes, sir. Charlie Bauer. The, the question I had, the, does anybody from the Cleveland area here know where the Thomas Brothers was located in the Cleveland area here? If you could give us a location on the camera, it would be nice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Go right ahead, sir. There's Walter Chris. Thank you, Walter. Thomas Brothers used to be... Uh, Table hardware. It's right next to Dr. Reinhardt's office, right on Washington Street. Okay. Right across from where the warehouse still is. Yep. Very good. Did you ever work for them? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I drove their truck. You did drive their truck. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you. We got a young lady. She'd like to identify herself, please. I'm Irene Dine, and I worked for Thomas Brothers for 12 years. 
Uh, I remember talking about her talking about the tractors when the Farmall M came out. Everybody wanted one of those because that was really bigger than the Farmall H. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they were, was a lineup. Whoever came next in line got the next tractor. Yeah. So I worked there from 48 to 59. Okay. I got a question for you. Did you sell any quack diggers? <laughs> <laughs> we must have sold one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. In his writings, Grandpa Fitzgerald also talked about what he referred to as the greatest invention. And I think at the top of the list was electricity, um, the tractor and the gas engine, the electric fencer. And again, I often don't think of, well, I wonder what it was like back in the day when they had the bulls running with the cows, but they didn't have electric fences. so. When the bull turned on you, the bull turned on you, and he was coming. So um, the electric fence was was a great invention, according to Grandpa. The, the quack digger, herbicide, pesticide, and fertilizer, artificial breeding, and the milk machine, of course. I can't fathom not having a milk machine. <laughs> So um, I put together a little timeline of milking cows. Um, Dad kind of helped me with this. So in the 1930s, um, that would be when Grandpa had just gotten out of high school, they were milking 15 cows by hand. In the 1950s, they were milking about 30 cows. And at that time, they actually had a vacuum line running through the barn. Um, so they, they began using milk machines. And then the milk machine would put the milk in a catch bucket, which would then have to be carried to the milk house and, and poured into milk cans. In 1956, they installed a bulk tank with a cooler. So, um, you know, really helped, helped to keep that milk cold. I would think that makes a huge difference. Uh, in 1962, they added a dumping station to transport the milk from the barn to the milk house. And as it, it was explained to me, is that was sort of a catch bucket that had a hose that ran. I said, Dad, did that thing like run right over the gutter before? <laughs> Pretty much, he said. So you no, no longer had to carry the milk cans, but now you had this hose that you had to make sure was kept clean. So. Um, as the person in charge of milk quality on our farm, I kind of appreciate that a little bit. Uh, in, and then in 1970 was when, at that point, Dad um, had graduated high school and um, was entering the partnership with Grandpa Fitz. Um, and they built a parlor with a pipeline. So at that point, the milk was um, transported by solid pipe. So now I have um, kind of the, the next generation and my dad's history and some of his memories. Um, dad graduated in 1968, 66, 66. Um, that was the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and after high school, he attended UW-Madison for their dairy short course. Um, that is a four-month program, is that right? November to March. In, from November to March of each year. Um, it's still offered today, and like I said earlier, my sisters have both uh, attended that program as well. Um, and then he returned to what is today Fitz Pine Dairy and became a partner with his dad, John. In 1970, they um, underwent a pretty major expansion for the day. Um, they, they got up to 150 cows. They had 330 total head with the livestock on the site, and they cropped about 550 acres. They milked in a parlor, which was a double eight. There were eight, eight cows in a herringbone fashion on each side, and then the cows were housed in a free stall. Um, some of the automation, of course, is starting to come in at this time, and they had automated feeding, and I'll explain that a little bit later. And the barn that they built was a slatted floor barn. So um, the, the pit for the waste was right underneath the cow housing. The 
this is a picture of that expansion in 1970. And so here we have that existing or that, that first um, barn that Grandpa Simon, Great Grandpa Simon would have um, built. This is the addition of, this is sort of an office and a milk house area here, and then the three stalls in the back. And so it's just an overshot of that as it's being built. This is a, a news article from 1975, so shortly after that expansion, they were Farm of the Week, um, and the, the newspapers had come out and, and taken some photos. Um, this is my Grandpa Fitzgerald, with I'm sure one of his favorite cows, and my Uncle Kevin in the milking parlor. And then, I know this is not a great picture, but it's what you get when you take a newspaper and try to put it on a computer. Um, so this is the feed conveyor, <coughs> and it would feed a pen of cows on either side, and then there's another one of these down over here. But the feed would be um, loaded onto that conveyor in a mixing room back here, and then it would go overhead and it would drop into that feeding area. Um, and then, of course, in these floors, there's slats so that the waste all falls through. This is an interesting story in that same newspaper article. is a picture of Grandpa John and my dad, Jim. And I'm going to read it over here because I think it's easier. But the, the article reads, to tell you the truth, we probably have too big a farm for just the two of them, two of us, Fitzgerald said. We get up at 4.15 year-round. During the summer, we work until 8 p.m. and we're done around 6.30 during the winter. Jim and his father operate a farm that under plow has about 530 acres of land. Oh, it says winter is the time he catches up on repairs and odd jobs that there isn't time for during the summer. Last week, the Fitzgerald father and son team were busy cutting away brush and growth along their fences. And the interesting part of this is uh, this past winter, we spent a lot of time cutting away <laughs> trees and brushes from actually the same stretch of land. It just keeps coming back. So um, some of the things haven't changed so much in dairy over the years. Okay, we're on. Okay, um, <coughs> some of Dad's, well, and I guess this would be more of the history of um, Dad's farm career. In 1982, um, he decided to go off on his own, and he built a tie stall barn. So uh, in that barn, the cows all had <coughs> their own stall, and we would go from cow to cow and, and milk them. Um, the name of the dairy was Fitzhaven Dairy. Uh, we milked 60 cows. We had 145 head um, total on the farm and ran about 214 acres. In the beginning, family did all of the milkings, all of the cropping, all of the work that needed to be done. And then eventually, um, we got up to 90 cows, and at that point, we hired in some, some help to assist us. Um, but we would switch out half the herd during milking so that we could get the extra 30 cows in, into the barn and milk. This is a picture of the, um, the oldest barn at um, the original Fitzhaven site where I live today. Um, it's also a picture of Charlie Bauer's next project. He's going to make a little <laughs> barn like this. 
Maybe not. I made that up. <laughs> um, the home where I live today in, in Centerville, right next to the dairy where, where my parents started their farm farming operation, um, we had, they had purchased from Walter Schutte, was the owner before us, and it's my understanding that it was homesteaded by the, the Logans. Were the Logans. The, the, the name, the name slipped me, but um, and and so that is a mile. Our dairy today is a mile east of Highway 42, on Highway F. And this is. Um, this is the dairy, um, pretty much as, as it looks yet today, but this is that tie stall barn operation that my parents built. And then this is that original barn that was seen in the previous picture. In 1997, um, my dad partnered with my sister, who would have um, finished high school and had been on the farm for a couple years. And then there was another non-family couple who had farmed with us for a few years. They all joined forces and they formed Soaring Eagle Dairy. In 97, a double 12 parallel parlor was built and a 400 cow freestall barn. We combined all of our cows and all of uh, the, the pieces and people of the business and, and built the, the new facilities. In 2005, uh, my sister Stacy and I, we came to the dairy and, and entered as partners. And at that time, we added a second free stall barn um, and added some additional stalls into our parlor as well. So I asked my dad what um, the greatest inventions were in his dairy career. And um, TMR stands for total mixed ration. And so a total mixed ration mixer was pretty critical in balancing rations. Um, when I was a kid, I remember when you fed the cows, you filled up the, the one cart with haylage and you filled up the other cart with some high moisture corn. And then you walked around with your bucket that had some protein in it and another bucket that had some mineral in it. You know, it was either one scoop or two of everything, or one shovel full or two, and you just sort of layered it in there for the cow. Science has taught us that to really get the maximum performance out of a, of a dairy cow, they have to have so much of all the right ingredients. And at my house, if I tell my kids they can go have a snack, if there's a choice between a Twinkie and a bag of carrots, they usually take the Twinkie. And our cows do the same thing. They'll, they'll go for um, not necessarily a balanced diet. So a TMR mixer is what has really pushed milk production um, from where it was when my dad started farming to where it is today. The milking parlor has changed. Um, things have become much more automated. Um, freestyle barns, even though we had them in the 70s, they're different today. The, we've, we've learned a lot about cow comfort and how important it is to um, have the beds be comfortable for the cows so that they go lay down so they're conserving their energy for making milk for milk production. So today's freestyle barns are, have bigger stalls and, and we use sand. I don't think my grandpa would have ever thought to, to have his cows lay on sand. Um, but it's, it's one of the things we've learned. Computers are critical in dairy today, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, feed bunkers have made the whole cropping part of the, the dairy industry um, a lot more efficient. It's much easier the way we do it today to, to pile the feed and seal it with plastic than it was back when you had to blow it up into the silo. Um, and I think those blowers were probably more trouble than they were ever worth. I, I remember days where somebody wasn't happy about the blower not working right. <laughs> and then equipment has changed. Certainly 
they're they're bigger, they're more efficient, um, and they they can do a lot more work than the McCor the, the Farmall M did back in 1946. So this is milk production. Um, in the 60s, Dad said that they probably got about 35 pounds of milk per cow per day. In the 70s, they were right at about 50. And this week, we were averaging about 89 pounds per cow. Um, and I, I think a lot of that is, is the result of properly feeding, feeding those cows. <coughs> this is um, the TMR mixer, our, our former one. It's retired now, but um, all of the ingredients that make up that cow's balanced diet get dumped in there and mixed together. So every bite full that the cow takes is balanced. And this is our dairy today. Um, again, this is the um, that original barn that we saw being raised. And then off in the front, you can't really see it very well, would have been the, the tie stall barn that Dad built in, um, in the 80s. This was the original barn that was built in 97, along with the milking parlor. This is called our special needs barn. All of our dry cows, any cows that are sick or off feed, are housed in special pens in this barn. This was added in 2000. This addition also let us grow internally a little bit while we were, before we were ready to build this barn. This was built in 2005. And our latest addition were these two small calf barns and they are just over a year old. Um, our calf program, um, calves are housed in this barn from zero to about two months. During that time, they're fed pasteurized waste milk. So any milk that's not fit for sale, we collect and we pasteurize it to feed to those baby calves. And then they move into this barn where they're group housed, um, they're housed together in there, um, fed grain and, and forages and things. And then at five months, our calves are loaded on the semi um, and they go out to Colorado where they're raised. So they're raised in, um, on dirt, in a dry lot environment. Um, it was kind of a, kind of a long story why, why our calves are in Colorado, but um, we looked at doing something here, but it got really expensive because here you have to build these big, huge farm buildings. And animals really transport well, so we um, send them out there and then they come back to us about two months before they're ready to have a calf of their own and, and enter the milking herd. We have a gentleman here who'd like to identify himself and provide a question to start off our second half, please. Go right ahead. John Wiegand. Uh, some fairly good sized farmer told well, my sister that <clears throat> right now with the milk prices they're losing like $25,000 a month. <clears throat> I was just wondering how are you handling that? Or do you have to change anything or can you just ride it out till it gets better or what? Thank you. Okay, we have a question on the floor and this young lady is uh, uh, going to attempt to answer it. Go right ahead, please. That's a very good question and, and comment, John. Um, we are back to uh, milk prices that I think were common in the 70s, and you saw once in a while in the 80s. Um, I think we saw them a few times in the 90s, um, and, and they're back, but all of our inputs are not back to where they were in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. So it is a period of, I. I would venture to guess that everybody that's producing milk today is losing money. Um, it's the case on our dairy. Um, I don't know, you know, the numbers off the top of my head. They're starting to turn around and, and they're starting to get a little bit better, but we're still losing money. Um, you know, it goes back to what Grandpa Fitz said in his writings, that if you lived through the Depression, you had a built-in sense of caution. And so 
you know, Dad luckily has been through some of this before, so part of that caution is during the good times, you stash them away, just like we do in our homes. You stash them away so that you have those funds to tap into to make it through the tough times. So, personally, I don't believe in bailouts. I believe in learning from Grandpa and Dad on how to be responsible and, and how to plan to make it through, through the tough times. Um, you know, and then you make it through your reserves and you go to the bank and, you know, th those things are happening. And uh, unfortunately, there are dairymen who may not, may not make it through. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough period. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. So, more about Soaring Eagle Dairy. Um, this is our parlor. We have uh, a parallel parlor, which means the cow walks in and makes a complete right angle into <clears throat> her slot. Uh, there's 16 cows on each side, and we do all of our work between her back legs. Um, there's different types and, and styles of parlors. We like this one because when those new cows come into the parlor and they're a little antsy and they're their legs kick forward, we're standing behind them. <laughs> so we, we kind of like that. Uh, this is a picture of the cow um, in the front. She's standing there. She's, she's given milk. Uh, we have three people on a milking shift. There are two people in the parlor harvesting milk at all times. And then one person goes out and brings the next group, usually it's 100 cows at a time, to the parlor. Those three people We'll milk 900 cows in seven hours. Um, all of this stuff up here is a computerized um, keypad that identifies the cow and it identifies how much milk she's given. And some dairies have that technology, that, that uh, equipment, some don't, but for us it's it's important, it's how we manage our cows. If a cow's not right, something's going on with her, the first thing that happens is she stops, stops eating. When she stops eating, she stops producing milk. So it's that um, technology that allows us to manage 900 plus cows. These are the cows at the feed bunk eating their PMR, the perfectly balanced diet. And the bottom picture is a picture of the freestall barn. The cow chooses to eat, lie down, get a drink of water. They move about freely in their pen. Um, their beds, as I mentioned before, have sand in them. Um, we put, we add sand to those beds about every five days. And the manure system that we have has the waste as it leaves the barn traveling over a very flat concrete slab where all the sand settles out. We clean it up, we stack it, it drains, it dries out, and we reuse that sand. So that's kind of a, a different way of doing things than, you know, Grandpa did. Um, we didn't start in 97 with sand. We had put what we thought was ideal for a cow, a big rubber-filled mattress, and we put a little, a little bit of sawdust down there. We thought that would be the best thing for the cows. But we found in our herd that our cow's hocks um, would get scratched up and, and sore, swollen. And so that prompted us to make this change where we use sand. We don't have those same problems anymore. And it's done a lot. We, our cows produce milk, more milk. They stick around longer. They live. They're they're healthier. Um, so that's kind of part of part of our facilities. Um, of course, inside they're protected from the sun, the wind, the rain. A lot of people think cows should be out on the pasture, and you know that's nice. It's it's a pretty picture when you're driving by. But it's not so, wouldn't it have been so nice this winter or when it's 95 degrees out or raining. 
We do drop curtains in our barn that allows the fresh air to circulate through. And then on the hot days in the barn, we have a sprinkler system. And so there's a water pipe that runs, <clears throat> can't quite make it out here, but it runs right about here in those cows above their feed alley. And in the hot months, I believe it's every 15 minutes that sprinkler will put out a mist of, of water to cool the cows off. And that runs for about three, three minutes to, to keep the cows cool. Today we um, are running about 1,400 acres of land, some of which is owned and some is rented from neighboring farms. We do a rotation of corn, soybeans, alfalfa, and winter wheat. We grow all of our own forage and some of our grains. Um, the grains, it always depends on what kind of year you have. In a dry year, if your yield is low, then everything goes into forage. And we purchase our grains, but in a good year, and we'll have some grain left over um, to provide for our own needs. And we do our cropping operations with our <clears throat> with my uncles, my dad's brothers, Jay and Bob, who are just a mile down the road. They own about half of the cropping equipment, and we own the other half, and we do all of our cropping together. Um, I'm sure this is my mother on her <laughs> favorite tractor. Um, she is the queen mower on the dairy. She knocks down almost every acre of hay that we have. And that's just the front view and then a back view of that alfalfa being cut down. How many, how many feet do you swallow hay at one time? <laughs> The question Charlie had was, how many feet of hay do we swap down at a time? And the answer is 28 feet. Oh, Julie, just, just go back um, to that last slide. Um, so yeah, I guess I could point out, is it 28 divided by 3, roughly? Yeah. So there's one deck on the mounted on the front end of the tractor, and then there's two decks mounted on the back end of the tractor. And those three decks combined will knock down 28 feet of alfalfa at a time. Does I mention where that mower is made? That is a Pottinger mower made in Austria. Dad had the privilege of taking a trip to Austria, the company. <laughs> we had one of the first Pottinger mowers in this area, and so, of course, they want everybody happy, and he got a trip to Austria to, uh, the, the, the question is, how do you get parts? No, I, and I think that's a great question, and so, even though it was a Pottinger mower built in Austria, there's a dealer local now, and, you know, you go through some of that, I think, early on where it's tough and they need to know what, what to have on hand, but I don't think we've had any real issue. No. Another Thank you, Mark, please. Well, Jacoby, Thank you. when road traveling, that fold up, the two back ones? Mm-hmm. Okay. The question on the floor pertaining to the equipment for road travel. And, and that is correct, Paul. The, the front is not really any wider than the tractor, so that one stays in place. But these two wings do fold up. Um, and they actually are, I don't know, maybe three, four feet taller than the tractor when they're folded up, but they, they don't take up a whole lot of room on the road. It's quite easy to drive this mower um, on the roadway. I have a question. Uh, there used to be crimping of hay. Do they still do that? Crimping is the same as conditioning, right? Right, I'm getting the nod. Okay. Um, and this does have a conditioner built in. So, okay. no, it, it does not, not have a conditioner built in. That please? Jim Fitzgerald. Yeah, the, um, the mower, and rather than a reciprocating sickle, has a series of, uh, of discs mounted under it, and each disc has 
two knives. Um, I guess you would say they're, they're similar to a section that would be on a sickle mower. <clears throat> so these spin uh, at a real high speed, and that's what actually cuts the hay. Um, they've actually, you know, you know they say thing, uh, how do they say that? Uh, what goes around comes around. Well, years ago, we did not condition or, or uh, crimp the hay. You know, when I was a kid growing up, you just cut the hay and hoped, hoped to dry it. Then they found out it, um, by conditioning it, which is breaking up the stem, it would um, dry faster. But back then, we were making all dry hay. So now they did research, and they found that if you do not condition it, it actually dries quicker from 80% moisture, the way it, the moisture that it is standing in the field, down to about 55% moisture, where we want to chop it for haylage. So they, they've kind of rediscovered this thing, and now they find out that um, for, the, for the way we, we harvest our feed now, it is better to harvest it or cut it without conditioning. Um, one more comment on that, um, that front unit is, is mounted on a front three-point hitch, similar to the three-point hitch on the back of the tractor that, that holds the two units in the back. And uh, the American manufacturers do not make a front three-point hitch. Um, also, we needed a PTO shaft in the front to, to power that front unit. So that unit um, was made in France. So um, I think our, our uh, US egg engineers are maybe a little bit behind. And um, Julie will have another picture coming up in a minute um, showing how we merge the hay. Oh, there it is. So the, um, the machine on both, upper, uh, both of the upper pictures uh, that picks up 30 feet of hay, that, that machine is 30 feet wide, and uh, moves it to one side. Then when we get to the end of the field, we, we turn around, we pick another 30 feet up, and, um, and drop that on that same row. So we actually end up with about 70 feet of hay um, in one row, and then you'll see, us, you'll see uh, the chopper on the lower left-hand picture, um, we chop it into trucks. We use three or four trucks, depending how far we have to haul it. And then <clears throat> Julie talked earlier about the bunker silos, and that would be the, uh, the picture on the right. So that's, uh, those walls are 12 feet high, and um, our bunkers are, we have uh, seven bunkers, anywhere from 40 feet wide to 60 feet wide, and they're all 200 feet long, and they're 12 feet high. And um, so we use one tractor, uh, the, the big tractor on the left, has a blade on the front of it, so the trucks dump the feed in front of the bunker, and then that tractor with the blade, um, incidentally, that tractor um, weighs about 50,000 pounds. And um, it's got, you know, eight big wheels and tires on it. Um, so that pushes, it, it makes about two passes, and it pushes the feet up into the bunker. And then the reason for the second tractor, which uh, you see also has a weight on the back, on the three-point hitch. Um, but combine those two tractors, pack that, that hay or corn silage, and, and push all the air out of it. Um, and I need to mention also, so we talked about the mower from Austria, the three-point hitch from France, the merger is made in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Okay, the question I got for Sandy is I understand you're the queen of the, <laughs> the reaper there. <laughs> Does it take any training to run that type of equipment? Uh, it took me about five minutes to learn. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Women learn quite quickly. Oh. <laughs> I almost say I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy.
Thank you. So I did a, another little graph on corn production and, and how things have changed. Uh, in the 1960s, Dad thought 85, 90 bushel to the acre was kind of a, a good crop. Uh, in the 80s, they were up to 120. And today, um, in an average year, we, we get 160 bushel to the acre. And so I asked the question, Dad, you know, what's all changed? And a lot of it is genetics and the technology going into um, the seed. Um, we have better planters. You know, Dad talked about studies and trials, and, and there's so much of that going on at the university, and I think also um, at the you know manufacturing level of, of these um, these implements. Um, this year we're we're planting double rows. The there's going to be two rows of corn that are really closely spaced and, and that the latest field trials say that that's going to produce a, a higher yield than planting the single rows. So, um, you know, things are always changing and they're, they're always learning more. We also have herbicides and, and fertilizers that, you know, have also come a long way in aiding us in producing a, a bigger crop. So computers to manage cows kind of seems strange, right? What, what would a computer do to manage a cow? Um, I brought some reports along that uh, I'll just pass around. They, they probably don't make a whole lot of sense to, because it's, it's just a lot of numbers and abbreviations, but our computer system um, has individual cow data, and this, these four or five pages stapled together are the information on one particular cow in our herd. Uh, her number is 2539. Um, she is six years and seven months of age. She is in pen four. If everybody's done what they're supposed to at the farm, she's in pen four. Sometimes we have problems with that. But. Um, she is in her fourth lactation. She had her first or her last calf on uh, August 17th. Um, She's been bred three times and is today confirmed pregnant with twins. Oh. How do you know that? I bet you were wondering. Um, so we determine a cow is pregnant by every week the vet comes out and will um, do a check on cows that, that have been bred. Um, and he uses an ultrasound. Um, different than the one I had when Haley was born, but an ultrasound nonetheless, and he can determine if there are two heartbeats um, in that cow, and, and so then we're kind of forewarned that there are twins coming, and we change the management of that cow. Um, when she goes dry, she goes into a special pre-fresh pen that gives her kind of a little bit of a better diet and, and things to help her condition through that pregnancy. This, this report has, you know, who she's bred to, who the sire of her calf is. Um, all of her milk production is on one page. <coughs> For each lactation, all of her test days when she went through and every 40 days, DHIA comes in and will test the cow's milk, um, how much milk they're producing, the quality of the milk, how much fat and protein is the milk. We do that on each individual cow and that data is in the computer as well. But again, as I mentioned earlier, um, key for those computers is is probably the report we rely on heaviest is called Down 20. And every morning we run this report and any cow whose milk production is deviated by 20% from the previous or from her average will show up on this report. And so we will often walk out in the barn in the pen 10 looking for 2285 and checking her out. You know, does she look sick? Does she have a temperature? Is her manure the way it should be? All of those things um, that we use to determine if a cow is well or not, but it's, it's the computer that allows us to keep track of and, and manage all those cows. <clears throat> and then we have lists. Um, this is a, a vet list. So on Tuesday, 
Kelly will print this report and it tells her exactly which cows to go and check. They have been bred or they were acting funny or we have problems with getting, getting a cow bred. So these are the animals that need to be checked. <coughs> There's similar reports for when it's hook trimming day, the computer will tell us who needs to be checked out, which cows need to be vaccinated this week, next week, next month, because it's all built into that schedule. And then um, also each day we get parlor reports. So it also helps me to manage our people. We have um, 11 full-time people that, that help us with the milking of the cows. And on this report, it tells me what time they started milking, what time they finished milking. <coughs> it's contagious, Jerry. I know. <laughs> Um, you know, it'll tell us how fast the cows milk out, which is an indicator of how well they did preparing the cows to milk. So the computer is a wonderful thing and um, really helps us with, with managing the dairy. Yes? What type of Name? Well, Jacoby. Thank you. <coughs> with type I milking and parlor, how do you get your DHIA sample? Thank you. Okay, we have a question on the floor about a sampling uh, of uh, particular cows, perhaps. Go right ahead, please. I didn't mention it earlier, but our parlor has a basement. And in that basement is where actually the milk line runs and the vacuum line runs. And there's a meter down there, which is what detects how much milk that cow produced. And there's an ability to put a little cup and a sampler on it. So while that cow's milking, um, there's like a little finger with a slot in it that sticks into the milk line. And so a little bit of milk gets diverted into that cup in the basement. And then that gets, that gets sent away and tested. <coughs> Does that answer your question? So in other words, he's there all three milkings? No, he's there for one milking. And then he relies on the computer captured data for the remaining to get the, the daily average. I have a question, Julie. Uh, you see you know, all over cities and everywhere, stores, video cameras. Do you have such things in your farm? We do have a video system. Um, currently, it's, it's just used in our parlor. Um, captures a couple different um, views of the parlor. I, I really use it mostly for training. Um, you know, we have a procedure. Cows, cows like the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again every day. They want, if I go in to touch a cow to milk her, or dad does, or Haley does, they want it to be the same every day. And so we teach that to our people in harvesting milk. And so if I see somebody kind of deviated from that, the camera helps us in, in teaching them how things should be done. I have another question. Uh, you were indicating that sometimes cows are skittish and trying to milk them the way you do. Do you have a training area for a fresh heifer or a cow that they get accustomed to something ahead of time? We, what we do is there, there's a group of cows, they're called Steemo. And so three weeks before a cow has a calf, they go on what's called a steam up ration. Again, specially balanced, the right amounts of salts and everything else that that cow needs when she has her calf to transition into the milking herd. And that group of cows, every Wednesday morning, we move up to our parlor. And so the, the heifers, the new, new moms mm -hmm. that, that are coming into the parlor for the first time, will have walked through our parlor at least three times because she's entered that pen three weeks prior to calving. Mm -hmm. she'll, she'll see the parlor three times before she ever gets milked. Okay, very good. Thank you. <coughs> Dan and I talked a little bit today about harvesting of hay in the 1960s versus what we're doing today. And Dad said in the 60s, 
if he bailed 10 acres of hay, it was a good day. Um, that required, that process meant one person would go out and mow, mow down the hay. They'd go through with the pull type conditioner and condition the hay. Then when it got drier, dry, somebody would run out with a tractor and a rake and they'd rake it. Then when it was finally ready to bale, two people would go out, one person on the tractor and one person on the wagon, and they'd bale up the hay, haul the hay back, and somebody loaded the elevator, and then there was another person in the mound. And, and I guess I mention this because going back a few slides, when you saw all that equipment and all those people harvesting hay, it seemed like a lot, but it really <coughs> required a lot. Back in the 60s, too, a lot of people doing a lot of different things. Um, today, on an average day, we will chop for, for haylage about 160 acres, and we've done up to 250 acres in a single day. <clears throat> Mom usually cuts down the hay. Somebody goes out to merge it. It's chopped. We usually have two, sometimes three trucks on the road, and then the tractors to pack the bunker. <coughs> so the size of the equipment has changed. The number of people to get the task done, I don't think really has. Certainly the dollars invested have. <coughs> but the productivity really has, has changed considerably. Another big area for change is manure management. Um, you know, grandpa, grandpa in the early days didn't do a lot of manure management because the cows spread it themselves. Um, Dad always says that, you know, in, when it when it was a small dairy and you did daily haul, you know, on, on a warm day, you would haul in the far corner of the back 40, but if it was cold or you were late for church, <laughs> it was going right out next to the barn. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get going. Um, today, and I brought along, I know a couple of you guys have seen this before, but this is our nutrient management plan, and we develop one of these every year. Um, into this goes soil samples, so we um, because of our size, we're considered a CAFO, a confined animal feeding operation, which means we have to have a permit by the Department of Natural Resources um, to operate because of our size. And so we fall under <coughs> even some additional rules than, say, a smaller dairyman would. Um, we're required to go out and sample our soils in five acre um, Every five acres needs to have a sample taken every three or four years. And so it's based on that soil sample. That gets combined with this analysis of the manure that's accumulated in our pit. That gets combined with the crop that's being planted and what that crop needs to grow. And so all of that um, is is what goes into manure management for us, and, and this is kind of the book we use. Um, <clears throat> we do this in conjunction with a crop consultant. He develops us, this for us. He does all the math and, and balances, balances things out. That book also has um, sensitive areas outlined on it, um, areas that we need to um, avoid spreading. Um, oh, or. Dear. No oh, beer. <laughs> Charlie promised me beer and popcorn. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's much different today than it was years ago, and I would say it has to be. You know, it's it's more cows, it's it's a complex system and it, it has to be managed um, very carefully. Julie, Jerry. I've got a question pertaining to the manure and things like that. I see some farmers are hauling a certain amount onto a field in a middle area, perhaps, 
and allowing it to leach or dry out, is that part of your process? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's probably what, what you see is called headland stacking. Okay. And um, that is usually a more solid manure. It's not what we spread on the field and okay. fall and work in. Okay. It's usually solid. And even at that, the DNR has regulations. It needs to be placed on a growing crop. The sites need to be approved by the DNR. I mean, okay. we have sites that are approved. Um, and we literally drove around the, the yard with the DNR girls in the, in the car and said, this is what we're thinking. This is where we want to place it has to be on growing crops. It has to be a certain level of solids. It can't run away. Mm -hmm. um, the area needs to be observed. And, you know, if there is sort of a, if it's draining away or it's pooling, that needs to be addressed and taken care of. Um, and, and really, you're seeing that more often today because of new regulations. In Manitowoc County, our dairy, and, and I think it's because, you know, we're one of those large dairies, we can't spread manure in the months of February and March. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but my calf barn, I have a hard time putting my calves through two months of not being cleaned out. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, primarily <coughs> straw and, and, you know, the... the what, what ends up in the straw, but it's mm -hmm. not liquid manure. That's right. So um, that is uh, becoming a more common practice, partly because of new regulations. Got another question for you? Sure. Uh, <laughs> with manure, uh, you apply that first, and then if there's a need for more fertilizer, you apply that later on. Is there anything down the road where they would apply this all ahead of time to your manure before you put it on? That's probably one I could defer to Dad. You know, I think we try to put on, in terms of manure, because mm -hmm. it's there, it's bought, it's paid for, Sure. it needs a place to go. We, we try to put on what the crop's going to need. Okay. Now, if we think we've put on you know, and, and, and typically we're putting on based on phosphorus. So we're measuring how much phosphorus is in and we're applying it. Okay. But corn, correct me if I'm wrong, needs more nitrogen than it does phosphorus. There's more phosphorus in the manure. So that's where the night that's why we're we're applying something later on. Okay. I don't know, would it ever make sense to put the nitrogen in the manure before it no, because it dissolves or it it's not always there. It can disappear. Okay. Nitrogen. Right ahead, please. Jim Fitzgerald, um, just commenting a little bit about um, the idea of adding fertilizer to the manure. The um, nitrogen is very volatile, and so when it's applied, and and that's one of the one of many reasons why we incorporate the manure immediately after applying it. Once it's in the ground, it attaches and it's and it stays there. Um, but it's it's not all. It, it, the the plant is not able to utilize all of it in the first year either. So that's why, if we need additional nitrogen, we'll put that on generally when the crop is about the corn crop is about four to six inches tall and we'll give it a little shot of nitrogen at that point. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Ooh. That's a question I have for Grandpa Fitz. <laughs> How did they handle that? And, well, dynamite, that's a good answer, because the one that I came up with this morning when I was pondering it was they left it, they planted a tree, and they cropped around it for years and years and years and years. And years. But um, actually, that, that was last fall. Um, Tyler, Tyler was out uh, working the field. And he said he was just about to fall asleep because he was using, we have GPS auto steer technology. 
So there is a box in the computer that talks to the satellite. And the first time you drive down the field, it's, it's marking your course. And then the box also knows that your piece of equipment is, I don't know, 18, 25 feet wide. And so the next time you go over the 18 or the 25, it knows right where you should be because it's going to follow that same first path that you took. So Tyler's cruising down the, the field and, you know, about to doze off because he doesn't have anything to do because the tractor's steering itself. And he said, all of a sudden, it went, <laughs> and I turned around, he said, and the whole earth was moving, and this was what was left. But our equipment today was actually, it, it, apart from shearing two, three-quarter inch bolts, the, the piece of equipment was fine, but it picked it up to this point, Jeez. right out of the ground. I stood in front of that with my arms spread, and it was fingertip to fingertip. So it is a big rock. Yeah. What did you do with it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we went down with a chain and a big heavy loader, and we loaded it up, and it is sitting down uh, in some tall grass at my place, and I think I want to take it and get Soaring Eagle Dairy with a big old eagle engraved on it and park it out front, but Whoa. <laughs> we'll see if that happens. <laughs> Not this year. Not this year. <laughs> and though, so many things have changed over the years, but some things haven't. I When flipping through the scrapbooks and the newspaper clippings, I found it ironic that Ronnie Walk is picking up milk for us here on the left in uh, the 80s. And this is him at our current facility, and this picture was taken within the last, I don't know, in the 2000s. So 20 years later, Roddy Walk is still picking up and hauling milk for us. And that's the end of my presentation. So now we have question and answers. Hi. Okay, there's one. We've got a gentleman here who will identify himself, please. Go right ahead. I'm Willard Mathias. I would like to know. How many pound, uh, gallons of milk or how much milk you haul in one day? Okay, thank you. We have a question on the floor for Julie. Go right ahead, please. We have um, two bulk storage tanks for our milk. One is up and down like a silo and the other is vertical, <coughs> kind of runs along the ground. And they each hold 50,000 pounds. And it takes about 14 hours to fill one of those. So we're probably about 80,000 pounds of milk uh, shipped a day. Because when, when we had our dairy, at, at the most we used in a day was about 40,000 pounds of milk, which about 24,000 went into cheese, and the rest went into bottles. So this, you could supply us with that milk that we'd have enough. <laughs> and how many cows were supplying you with we, the 40,000? We had we, we over 100 farms. Okay. And, okay. And, uh, well, some were like 12, 13 cans of milk. Some were one or two, you know, dirty. Mm -hmm. But uh, what what gets me is uh, when we were in business, yet there were so many farms that if uh, Ma and Pa and the, and the son and his wife both would be on the farm and they'd run about four to five cans of milk during the summer. During the winter time, they'd have two, and they both made a living, both mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. And later on, this one young farmer, he bought himself another farm and paid cash. Now, I mean, uh, they always say that farmers weren't making any money, but now here's just a, a small farm, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they were made enough to buy another farm. And this, this was liberty. I, I know those people who, well, it was currents and milk customer too yet, but there was a lot of farms like that that were, never had more than five, six cans of milk, but two families living off of that. And I, I think, you know, my grandpa is a testament, you know, he without a father um, managed his, his mother and his siblings through that, and it was the, I'm sure, one can of milk with the 15 cows um, a day, but the 100 chickens and the two hogs, yep. and 
the horses. It was all of that combined that, that sustained dairy for, for his family back in that day. I appreciate that. I got another question for Julie. Uh, electricity is important to your farm. Um, do you have anything on usage or uh, any efficiency situations with that and so forth? And if you have a bill that you might talk about, <laughs> you can mention it if you wish. You know, from a kilowatt or a megawatt or a watt standpoint, I couldn't, couldn't even venture to guess okay. where that is. Um, you know, I think our dairy is no different than we are in our homes, all of us. Um, you know, if the lights aren't on, we turn them off, right, girls? Yeah. Busted them just today, this morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, I walk in, all the lights are on. You know, it's the same way at our dairy. We do things like the milk pump that transfers the milk from our basement pipeline up to that bulk tank is variable speed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when there's four cows on in the parlor, it runs very slow or not at all. But when we get, you know, a really efficient period where there are lots of cows and lots of milk going in, at that point the, the pump will run at a higher speed. Same thing with our vacuum pump. Um, you know, we don't want to pay for electricity that maybe we don't need, so okay. we try to be as um, conservative as we can. Okay. Even, even from the point of, you know, the lights that we install, we, we take a look at what's more efficient. Um, and, and will save us in energy costs in the end. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no I have a young lady. She'd like to an, uh, indicate her name first of all, please. Audrey Erdl. I was wondering, what do you use for backup when the power goes out? Because I know I worked at the co-op for 22 years, and I think it was in the 70s when we had the ice storms, and we were out of electricity for a whole week. Thank you. We Ready. have we have a standby generator um, that runs on diesel, and um, it it will automatically detect a power outage and will start all on its own. Uh, in addition to that, this kind of goes back to your your energy question. We also have what's called interruptible power <coughs> from Wisconsin Public Service, and so. Um, during peak demand for them, usually it's in the summer months on really hot days, they will shut the power off to our farm and we'll run on generator. Um, we get a, a better rate for electricity for doing that, but it, it sort of lessens the demand during those really peak usage times for public service. Do you have a question or a, uh, advice from the floor? <laughs> Mom says that our electric bill is about $5,000 a month. Oh. You know, and I wanted to say this earlier, and I didn't know if I should, but I'll sh I just want to take a poll. <clears throat> the Rock merger, which was made in Italy. Anybody want to venture to guess on the price tag? Mm. $200,000. No, not More quite. than $50,000. <laughs> $75,000? More than $200,000. It was $130,000. 130, $130,000. And, you know, that's really, the fact that we do all of our cropping with our uncles means that we're running that over um, probably twenty five or 3,000 acres um, combined between the, the two farms, and that's, you know, and it's not all hay in one year, but um, in, in the rotation, there's quite a few acres that this machine services. Um, and um, the other option for us was a lot less costly, but we felt that this was a, a much more durable machine and a better investment for us. Okay. okay. We got a gentleman here. Yeah, Charlie Bauer, I got a question. That machine up there now, will that machine wear out or will it become obsolete before its lifetime? <laughs> we have a gentleman here. He can uh, try and help us answer. Jim one. Fitzgerald. Thank you. Will the machine wear out or become obsolete? Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Okay, we got a question on the floor and pertaining to how many years you guesstimate you will have that piece of equipment. I probably didn't answer that very well, Charlie, but, um, you know, I would hope that we would get at least 10 or 15 years out of that. And um, I'm sure that technology is going gonna, is gonna to change real rapidly on that. That's a whole new concept in, in, in moving hay. Um, prior to that, we use rakes. Uh, one of the problems with rakes is you keep kicking the hay across the field and you pick up stones. So this, this machine lifts it up onto a belt which carries it across. And uh, these machines have only been out, you know, like uh, probably four to six years. And they're making some pretty good strides in improving them. Thank you. Okay, we got a final question, maybe, at this point in time. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Fred, Fred Jacoby. It's not that simple. I got a couple of questions, but they're quick. Uh, I'll give you the questions and you can respond. Uh, first of all, I was wondering uh, where you sold your milk to. And then when you talked about how much milk you had, I'd interested in a semi truck. I don't know how much a semi truck holds. And does anybody, do you know what the mower costs? I was wondering about that a long while. Our milk is shipped to Lana Lakes. And I think I heard once that Grandpa Fitz was a founding member of Lake to Lake. Um, so Lake to Lake became Land Lakes. Um, but we've kind of been, been Land Lakes people all our lives. Um, a, the semi, the milk semis that you see are usually 6,000 gallons. And that's the same as 50,000 pounds, roughly. Um, the question on the mower, the mower was much less expensive I think uh, by the time we bought the hitch and the PTO and the mower, it's probably around sixty-five or seventy thousand. Sixty-five or seventy thousand. You know, but that it doesn't drive. You still need something to drive with both of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Julie. Invite that um, if anyone would like to come and visit and see, um, have a tour. You're you're welcome. Just there's our phone number is on the brochure. Um, give a call and, and we'd love to walk you through and show you what it looks like and smells like and everything up close and personal. One thing that hasn't changed though. That hasn't changed. They still smell. They still make the best, most delicious and nutritious product, I think, though, yeah. uh, yeah. That, that can be made. So sure. you've got to take the good with the bad, I guess. Do, do we get a ride around them? Not you get a ride to walk in all these parts. Yeah. <laughs> Dad's getting me a golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> At your suggestion, right? You suggested we have a golf cart, and we'll take you around, yeah. Thank you. Okay, it's, if I have a comment, yes. Okay. Yeah. Jeremy's got a comment. I did tour their farm once, and it did not smell, not like other farms. It was very excellent, I must say. And, mm -hmm. and that depends on the day, you know. <laughs> and and the, you know, it, the humidity, the atmospheric pressure, whatever. There are days that are really good, and there are days that are not so good. Okay, we're not going to do our normal closing where we ask for introductions again, but I think we should give Julie a big hand for her wonderful job. <laughs> She said she wasn't going to talk to me tonight because I didn't offer to go out and help her pick stones this morning. <laughs> we pulled in and a drapes closed and the door locked. And <laughs> uh, we don't have a particular subject matter for next month, but we're planning on having a meeting here. And if there's any other suggestions that we can get from the floor here, other topics that we should cover. Uh, We've been going now a little over nine years, and, and we cover some fantastic stuff. At, and we wanted to do a modern farm here one time. I still like to get a farmer that was farming from the 40s and before, with maybe with horses and, and the different sizes of equipment and things like that, and the amount of milk they produce and the crops and all that. And does Kathy have anything else she want to add? I just want to thank the Fitzgerald family for the uh, wonderful presentation. Just absolutely excellent. And it was my pleasure. 
And if you need a library card, you can get a library card downstairs to check out their DVDs. Um, and they're good at UW Sheboygan, UW uh, Manitowoc, I believe, and Fox Valley. And they're good at about nine or ten different places there. So I guess we'll see you all next month, and Kathy will be sending out a card. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie.